Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, I'm the head of Deloitte Analytics Institute, and um, we are here in Berlin as an accelerator to um, do a multidisciplinary approach um, towards AI, big data architecture, and data strategy. And we are a team of um, 106 uh, people in different domain areas sitting here and serving our clients, uh, serving federal institutions, working together with cutting edge technology providers and as well as academia to deliver solutions to our clients. Um, now I have to click. Perfect. So this you missed. Um, I want to make an effort to frame the buzz around AI. Um, the idea that in our era we are somehow seeing the emergence of an intelligence in silicon uh, that rivals our own is um, very entertaining. It is also exciting and frightening to the same extent. And first and foremost, it's very distracting. Um, in fact, there is no um, single definition of what AI actually is. Um, in reality, it's a wide array of technologies that can be brought together um, to enable machines, like machine, machine computers, to act with what appears to be human-like levels of intelligence. AI today is probably known as narrow AI. You've heard that before on the big stage. Um, it is able to do very narrow tasks, like um, object recognition, facial recognition, or driving a car. Researchers are prone to research further into general AI, which supposedly will beat us in most of our cognitive tasks. Unlike humans, AI software is still unable to carry out multiple complex operations at the same time. Now, Historically, the tale of AI is kind of a roller coaster ride. It's um, optimism uh, with every major breakthrough and disappointment when reaching an impasse. Um, um, Substitute leapfrog moments for AI include in the 90s, the World Wide Web happened. Then in the 2000s, cloud came available for the masses. That actually helped a lot. Um, cost of storage declined. If you imagine that uh, in the last 35 years, storage costs declined by 17 million X. It's kind of a big deal. Um, that calls actually for larger unstructured data sets to be tiered according to the basis of data users patterns and uh, performance requirements of applications. Uh, here by mapping the storage and data users patterns to the business um, requirements. Also, we've seen a surge of innovation when it comes to computing cores. So CPUs are dwarfed by the ability of GPUs. However, there's so much circuitry on a GPU that's actually not needed for machine learning because neural nets are quite simple. They are metrics, multiplications, and nonlinearities that um, you can build silicon directly to do that. Google uses TPUs for some of their more niftier machine learning approaches and cases. And a TPU is 30x more performant and it is much more energy efficient. Um, also, most of you in this room know that the algorithms underlying our current state of art uh, actually developed for decades now. The only difference is that they've put on higher performing hardware and are trained with much larger data sets. Now, designing smart AI systems in itself is a cognitive task, and there is a certain ambiguity to that. That's why the title is The Double-Edged Promise. Along the lines of trust, liability, security, and control, there are very prominent voices warning us to be mindful when thinking about AI. Um, to name a very, f very few concerns, um, keeping in mind that this event is called the rise of AI, I couldn't resist to uh, quote Skynet in the making. 
Um, let's assume that the drive for self-preservation and resource acquisition is inherent in all systems of a certain degree of intelligence. Um, and with techniques like deep learning, um, laying the groundwork for computers to learn more about the world around them, how can we control and guide machines if this is the case? Um, for the ethical concerns, um, if AI is programmed to do something devastating, and here I want to reference autonomous weapons, these are AI systems in the end programmed to kill. Um, in the wrong hands, this is very bad news. Um, moreover, an AI arms race could it inadvertently lead to an AI war. To, to avoid a, a hostile takeover of such a machine, um, these machines would be built very robust. Um, that uh, would make it quite hard for a person um, to attack and overtake. On the other hand, it also would um, pose a great risk of people losing control over these machines. The risk is even present now with narrow AI and will only substantially decrease if autonomy and intelligence increases. Data privacy. Now, I'm not going to take a step and talk about next week's Friday, GDPR kicking in. I'm, I'm more I'm more on the point of, of saying that do we have the ability to control and to know what data is being collected, ensure that the data that is collected is correct, update the information or provide the necessary context to misaligned values. Now the question here is how do we instill values in machines and how do we negotiate with those machines if and when we believe that the values are likely to differ from our own. Now to the positive side of things, and I could ramble on for, um, let's say, negative impact and scenarios for a long time, but I don't have the time now. Um, if, if such a system could potentially undergo re recursive um, self-improvement, triggering an intelligence explosion, it would indeed be uh, the ultimate search engine, beating us at our own game. Um, driving competitive edge, um, our clientele is largely embracing and translating AI to add substantial value to automating and augmenting processes and services already. And they are all around us, the way we navigate, consume, decide, operate. Even running critical infrastructure like power grids is largely supported by AI. Um, the journey has long begun, um, and it's primed to penetrate and scale on enterprise level. Absolutely deserving to be classified as an arms race, with very little potent players playing a leading role. It is won by talent, entrepreneurship, and accepting controlled risks. <coughs> to the domain of service for mankind, if this super intelligence would be coined, it would probably help eradicate war, disease, and poverty, and so it could be one of the biggest events we can witness. From agriculture to medical diagnostics, um, it will support and is already supporting the well-being and welfare of society. Um, creating such a surge of human creativity with unprecedented uh, new possibilities um, will help us reinvent ourselves and maybe become something different. Um, also, there's lots of talk um, for the evolution of employment, that AI is going to steal all our jobs away. Well, I do believe that in combination with universal pay and newfound love for that human creativity, we've all missed out when looking into an SAP interface. Um, it will beat uh, the changes human labor has undergone uh, so far by a lot. Um, now I want to talk not only about dirty data, um, so I want to talk about um, these um, concentric uh, circles over there. So machine learning and deep learning as a subset for um, machine learning are at the core of every AI system. Deep learning allows um, the computational models composed um, of multiple processing layers uh, to learn representations of data with multiple levels of abstraction. So the key here is that these layer features are not designed by the human engineer, but rather um, using the data 
and general purpose learning techniques. Now the depth in deep learning is um, related to the complexity of the problem, not the model. One critical advantage machine learning has is that it is very robust to dirty data. What's dirty data? It's um, badly parsed, spotty, um, missing information, incorrect values, duplicate records. Every executive will know that dealing with dirty data will be and is the bane of their professional lives. Machine learning's flexibility and ability to learn and improve over time um, means that dirty, dirty, dirty data can be processed uh, with far greater uh, accuracy. It also means that the technology uh, scales uh, very well, uh, something that has become very important in our era of ever-increasing data volumes. Now, a fun fact is that um, only 0.5% of all data is ever analyzed or used. Now, if we put that into the relation of that by 2020, each human being on this planet will produce 1.7 megabytes of data per second, resulting into a surge of 44 trillion gigabytes. This is quite big, but it's not smart. But there is lots of potential. Now to the centerpiece um, of this and coming also slowly to a close. How to make it work is a big word. I, I work for a consultancy. Um, this is part of our DNA. We try to figure out and help. But I want to twist it um, in this um, scenario a little. Um, we take this stance from having worked on hundreds of use cases in the past years. Also, we take this stance uh, from our multidisciplinary approach to tackling such a theme like AI. Um, our clients have embarked on this journey to seek to increase this, the value add they see in the first promising steps towards AI. And to give you an idea of what the vectors are that our clients are requesting, here are the top five of the last five, four months. Uh, so on the first uh, spot is NLP with advances in, in, in OCR. The second bit is early warning systems. The third bit is knowledge management. Um, then um, there's computer vision in all its applications and uh, production quality optimization. So this is the demand side of our business. Um, and with that, we can, we can clearly say that clients are moving slowly away from expert judgment systems largely embracing rule-based systems supported by uh, RPA and robotics uh, and turning towards um, a windy and very, very cumbersome path towards uh, a judgment-based um, solution. Um, adhering to the convergence um, trend in big data architecture, data uh, is put in the center of gravity. Now, data centricity actually calls for a systematic collection uh, and cataloging of data assets. Now, they can only become an asset if um, they are ready to be used to generate business value. I talked about dirty data before, and you all know these haystacks, where you try to find a needle in. First you build the haystacks, or you define the needle. Um, I'm more into the picture of a warehouse where you can clearly describe and see what you find in each you know, compartment. It's like bread, sugar, and milk. Um, because you need to understand the potential, know how to read the data, and only to harvest that and put that into value add. Um, with the help of that meaningful metadata in a central catalog, um, data can be found, um, understood, and used even beyond its collection. And that's the most important part, these last words of that sentence. I try to sketch it here, away from the haystack to a data asset inventory. Coincidentally, it also reads DAI, which stands for the Deloitte Analytics Institute. Um, let's call this the data asset inventory for now, and let it be flanked by a comprehensive um, strategy and operating rhythm to ensure that your data doesn't become your liability. Um, and on this note, I will present the last of my slides. 
Um, and I want to close with the most important aspect for me personally when bringing such a technology like AI to life. A journey um, towards AI starts from the front end, uh, from the human interface, um, hereby taking well-measured strides um, towards business value and customer value. Um, the human-machine collaboration, process architecture and design make all the difference between the output of an algorithm and the actual desired outcome. So in this sense, think of Margaret and think of John.